We're going to be looking tonight at verses 30 through 56. We're going to call the message a life of influence. I don't often start a Bible study or message like this, but today's been a particularly stressful day for some of us. I feel very agitated in spirit for a lot of reasons, not just because of what's going on in the country. Sometimes in church work, you just have those days, and today's been one of them. It's a Wednesday. So I'm going to pray first, and then we're going to dig into God's Word for a few minutes. Father, you know our hearts, and you know at times our agitated, troubled spirits. And so for a few minutes tonight, we need to be fed, our souls need to be fed. As we gather in kind of a chilly night in a big old room, we need to be fed from your Word for a few minutes and be reminded of your truths, and just, um, uh, just have you speak to us as you do. Uh, regardless of what's going on in our words. So we kind of humble ourselves before you now. We open up your word. We sit at the feet of your word. And I pray that you would supernaturally speak to us and even speak through the few things that I will say to our souls and not make it be directly applicable to our hearts and lives in Jesus' name. Amen. If I were to ask this room, these people in this room tonight, uh, do you want your life to make an influence? Do you want to be as it were on ministry to other people? I know you would raise your hand and say, yes. Somewhere in your walk with the Lord, uh, God has done a work in your heart and soul, and you have said, Lord, I want my life to count for your sake. I want to have an influence on people's lives for your name's sake. I'll use the word ministry generically. When we, this room thinks of ministry, we think of the paid ministers, the pastors, and all that. And that's true. That is a role that some people have in ministry. God called me years ago to the ministry. But in the Bible, while that's true, the overall truth is that once you got saved, all of us are in ministry. We are all in, our roles might look differently, but all of us are in ministry. We bear the name of Jesus to this world we are on the planet to make an, a difference and an impact. Until the day we die, we're all in the ministry. Well, here in our passage uh, today, this is the early part of Jesus' ministry. He's probably only been with the 12 disciples a few months. You know that. Um, and he is actually preparing them for a life of ministry. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, knows his future, that he's only going to be a short time on the planet and he's building up a group of men, those 12 men, a few other men and women. He had about 120 disciples by the time uh, his, of his ascension. But at this time, he's still about two years from the cross, two years from going back to the Father. And these men don't know it, but he is building a movement of men to take his name to the world and change the world. Uh, we miss so much of Jesus' ministry unless we realize that so much of what he's doing is he's pouring his life into a few people who will in turn change the world. You probably know this. Uh, one, about approximately one year after the ascension, the church in Jerusalem had gone from about 120 to 10,000. They would eventually change the world, and we are a product of that right now. But the Lord Jesus was building in and preparing men to do a life of ministry. And again, they didn't even know that. But so much of what's going on in Jesus' ministry, again, is to teach these people how to do ministry when he is gone. In the story, we're, uh, the, the few verses we're going to read and the stories that, that we're going to cover, Jesus is actually teaching these men how to do ministry. He's teaching them, really, I'm going to give you five teachings or lessons he gives them, but it's eternal lessons about having a life of influence, specifically doing ministry. Which, again, this room is easy for me because everybody in this room, I know this room, that you go, I am here tonight to be fed so I can go out into the world and have my ministry to the world. True? Okay. We're in Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 30. Look what it says, and I'll tell you the, a little bit deeper more of the context. And it says this in verse 30, Mark 6, And the apostles gathered together with Jesus. That's the twelve. Sometimes called apostles, some call, sometimes called disciples. And they reported to Jesus all that they had done and taught. Now go back to verse 7 in chapter 6. That's the real context. 
Look at verse 7 of chapter 6. And he, Jesus, summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs, and he was giving them authority. This was the first time that they, were, they had done ministry without Jesus. These first six months, they have followed Jesus ministering to the crowds and everybody, and they just sat back and learned. For the first time, it's recorded there in verse 7, now Jesus sends them out on alone. alone. Now in verse 30, they're coming back, they're excited. Lord, let, me tell, let us tell you about our ministry, what we've done. This was probably two or three days, could have been longer, but they've had a great revival meeting. They're coming back telling their, the Lord, this is what's happened. Now watch from verses 31 through, we're going through 56. I'm, I'm going to show you five different scenarios. And you're going to see Jesus teach these men, I'm going to call them five lessons about influence are five lessons about your ministry. Again, he's preparing them for a life of ministry once he's gone. Here's the first lesson. It's in verses 31 and 32. Now remember, they've been doing ministry. They're excited. Look at the first thing Jesus is going to teach them. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a lonely place. I, I would not have thought Jesus would have said that. I would have thought he'd said, on the momentum of the excitement of your ministry, let's go do more. Let's get back out there and go. But he ironically had sent them out, and they were probably weary and tired. And then he says, now let's come away to a lonely place and do what? Underline your Bible, and do what? Rest a while. In parentheses, he's going to, the scripture tells us why he said that to them. Look what it says. For there were many people coming and going, and they, that is the disciples, did not even have time to stop and eat. Verse 32, and they, the disciples, went away in the boat uh, with Jesus to a lonely place where, or with who? By themselves. I'm going to tell you, interesting, eternal spiritual truth about influence and ministry that Jesus is teaching his disciples. Here's what it is. First of all, it's what I'm going to call the lesson of coming away. Of coming away. Jesus was telling them, let's get alone to a lonely place to do what? To take care of yourself. First of all, he's telling them, you need physical rest. You're worn out. I created your body. It doesn't work well when it's tired. And ministry and trying to have an influence is very tiring. First of all, I want you to get some rest. And you haven't even eaten. You've been so busy doing all this stuff for everybody else. I want you to eat and rest. I want you to physically take care of your body. But there's a second thing he's teaching here about rest. He's saying, and you're going to come away and learn how to spiritually rest alone with me. Here's the great spiritual truth that all of us who want to have influence through our lives, all of us who want to do ministry have got to learn. While we're, hear me, watch this. While you're taking care of everybody else, their physical needs, their spiritual needs, you better learn how not just to take care of them, but to take care of you. If you don't, you'll not be able to take care of them for as long as I want you to. I've been in vocational ministry for 30 years I burned out after about five or six years before I actually came to this church I had a few months that I just kind of had to take a break from ministry I was about 31 years old and I realized I'd spent the first eight years of my vocational ministry I didn't physically rest I did not know how to spiritually rest and about eight years in I was done emotionally speaking I had to get away for a while in that year before I came to this church you know what I learned I learned how to physically rest and spiritually rest Somebody's asked me, Jerry, how, how long, how, what's the, been the, the, the key to your longevity at First Baptist Church? Well, first of all, they're desperate. Number two is, um, I learned how to come away. I, it took me, I had to crater at 30 before I learned that. When I was 31, I came here, and I came with one skill. I had the skill of knowing how to come away. I already knew how to minister to people. I really did in a lot of ways. I knew how to give myself away. I knew how to take care of people. I did not know how to take care of myself. And, and the old candle just went, shoo, it just burned down. I burned at both ends of the candles, it burned out. Um, uh, you, you ever been on a plane? Well, of course you have. It's been a long time since any of us have been on a plane. But I remember years ago, the first time I got on a plane, I actually really listened to the, the uh, flight attendant tell us the instruction of the mask. 
I, I'd been on planes for years, never listened to them. It's terrible. I remember listening one time and going, she just told us if you have a child next to you, and I, that's probably about the first time I remember my children flying with me, if the plane goes down or it loses oxygen, do not put that mask on your child first because while you're trying to get that on them, you're going to lose oxygen and pass out. You put the mask on you first so you can breathe. The child's going to be desperate, but, but you're going to be able to breathe, and then you'll be able to have the strength to put it on them. They're going to be okay. But if you're taking care of them first, if you pass out, they will die with you. If you'll take care of yourself first, get air into your lungs, you'll be able to take care of them. And I thought, that is such a radical truth of life. It's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Men, you come away. You take oxygen for yourself because I want you to spend a lifetime giving oxygen to everybody else. But if, if you don't not take care of yourself, you're going to pass out and die and you're going to be good to no one eventually. I don't have time to elaborate on this, but this is a life principle, much less a spiritual principle. You got to learn how to get physical rest and spiritual rest, not because you're self centered. Not because you only care about yourself, but I care so much about these people over here, but I better take care of myself before I take care of them for the long haul. If you're at one of our parenting seminars, we will tell you the very first thing you have to learn how to do a parent is, is know how to take care of yourself, be emotionally, spiritually healthy, so for a lifetime you can take care of your kids. Don't spend all your time taking care of your kids. You'll be worn out. won't be any good to them, really, over the long haul. Isn't it crazy that Jesus, who is building men for a lifetime of ministry, these men come back so excited after this great ministry, and you expect Jesus to say, let's run harder. He said, slow down. Stop. Let's get in a boat. You eat, you get some physical rest, and I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to speak to you. And he's also telling these men here, you got to be able to stop. Even after I'm gone, my spirit will inhabit you. And I'm going to give you my word. I'm going to give you my spirit. And you'll have to do this. Even after I'm gone, you're going to have to learn how to be alone. Here's my question for all of us in this room who want to have a ministry, who want to have a great influence. And you've already had it many ways. If you want to keep doing this for the rest of your life, you'll have to learn. You probably already have in this room. But you have to learn the principle of being physically rested and spiritually rested, which strengthens you and you can keep going on. Does that make sense? It's an eternal life principle. You gotta let the Lord physically and emotionally and spiritually take care of you. I was telling one of our staff members here today, I said, Let me tell you what you need. He's a young guy, I've been here a while. I said, You need to find here over Thanksgiving, three or four days, and you get alone with God, you get alone with your family, and you recharge your battery, you're worn out, it's your problem. I, no, Jerry, it's more than that. I said, Let me tell you, your problem is you're worn out. And I said, I'm speaking to myself sometimes. Here's what I want you to do over the, over the Thanksgiving break. You find three or four days and you get alone with the Lord and pray and read his word and get fed, have some time with your family, then come back recharged. And then it's like a halftime. After two quarters, we have a halftime, not because the game's over with, but so I can get recharged and go back in the game. You need a halftime. Okay, enough of that. There's a lesson of coming away. I'm going to run out of time. Number two, you're going to see this lesson, verse 33 and 34 about ministry. Look what Jesus says. They get out of the boat, basically. And the Bible says, and the people saw them going, that is the disciples. And many recognized the disciples, and they ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. I mean, they, the people, there was such a movement of Jesus in this day, and, and the disciples became celebrities. The people were clamoring for their attention. So you have to also picture thousands and thousands of people excited to see Jesus and the disciples. Look at verse 34. And when he, Jesus, went ashore... He saw a great multitude of people. The, the scene here is, I don't have time to explain it, but there would have been, he would have gotten on the shore, this is the Sea of Galilee, and he would have looked up, and he would have seen a mass of people. Look what Jesus says he felt. And Jesus felt, what is it? Compassion for them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. You know what that word there, compassion, means? It doesn't mean he feels sorry for them. It means his heart broke with love for them. He looks at them as the creator. He's face-to-face -face with these people of all kinds, rich, poor, healthy, unhealthy, and his heart broke. And he said he, he saw them like they were just lost in life. They were just lost. I mean, they were lost to the purpose. They were lost spiritually. And here's the second lesson he was going to teach the disciples. It's what I call the lesson of compassion. Without elaborating on this one much, much, um, you know what fuels your ministry? 
besides being able to get alone and let the Lord fill you and feed you, you know what fuels your ministry? is love for the people that you minister to. Don't ever lose that. Don't ever lose that. It's the, you, you, and, and I mean a love where you go, my heart hurts for folks. Heart breaks for people. And you don't need, you should never lose that. Um, you need to ask God, God, give me a sense of the spirit to hurting people to this world. It's so lost. We all have a tendency to look at this lost world and be so mad and angry and upset. And I understand that and scared. Really, what needs to happen is in our soul, when we are at our best place, we look at this world and we go, they're so lost. It's like there's a sheep running around and there's no shepherd to guide them. When Jesus saw that, his heart broke and said, oh, I got to do something about this. The lesson, the second lesson of ministry Jesus is here saying is the lesson of compassion, to have love for people in general, and more for us this is this. We have to have love for lost people specifically. To the day you die, outside of your love for God and your love for family, and the people closest to you, we all have to love lost people. Love in the sense that without Jesus, they're gone. And there has to be a sense of going, my heart breaks. They're like sheep without shepherd. They need the Lord. It'll fuel you and drive you. The other thing that keeps your ministry going is, is when you go, my heart breaks for people. Breaks for how lost and hurting they are, and it breaks how lost spiritually they are. Number three, verses 35 through 44. Third lesson Jesus is going to teach his disciples is through the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, again, Jesus is doing everything here in this section of Scripture to teach his disciples how to do ministry. He's fixing to use the example of the feeding of 5,000 to teach them an eternal principle of ministry. Verse 33 says this, And the people saw them going, and many recognized I'm sorry, verse 35. And when it was already quite late, Jesus' disciples came up to him and began saying, This place is desolate, and it's already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. What's happening there is it's nighttime. They've been ministering all day to these people. They're way out in the countryside. There's no marketplaces. There's no food. And, and you know, like Jesus didn't know this, disciples say, hey, Jesus, it's dinner time. Everybody's hungry, and there's no, nothing to eat around here. Uh, there's no food trucks around here. There's nothing to eat. Lord, send them to eat. Look what Jesus says in verse 37. But Jesus answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. <laughs> it's kind of a direct statement. They're going, there's, oh, yeah, there's not. No, it's a ministry principle he's teaching them. He said, no, you're going to feed the people. Lord, we can't feed the people with anything. Okay, now he's going to teach them. Look at this. And they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii, which was a lot of money, by the way, in that day, uh, on bread and give them something to eat? So, Lord, you're saying we need to go into town, spend all of our money we have to feed all these multitudes of people. Again, he's about to teach them something. Verse 38, he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. Probably perplexed when they found out, they said, uh, Lord, we have five uh, little pieces of bread and two fish here. Uh, this is a lot of people in this room. Doesn't feed that. Look what he says, verse 39. And he commanded them all to recline by groups on the green grass. Uh, Peter, you go in your group over here, John, you're here. There's tw- y'all get 12 groups, y'all scatter all out. Okay, Uh, then he goes on, verse 41, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, here's the key, and he kept giving them to his disciples to set before them, and he divided up or literally multiplied the two fish among them. He walks around, here's Peter, here's yours, John, here's yours, I got 12 of y'all. I got, I got a little bit of bread, a little bit of fish. I just keep giving to you guys. Okay? See where it goes. Verse 42. And they all ate and were filled up. Here's the key, verse 30, 43. And they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also the fish. And verse 44. And by the way, there were 5,000 men who ate those loaves. Well, it's a miracle. It's a miraculous story. Uh, but here's the ministry truth that Jesus is teaching them. Again, everything in the Bible has to be in the context. We oftentimes take that story and move it out of context and just say, watch Jesus do a miracle. Well, the miracle was for the point of doing what? He's trying to teach his disciples ministry, 
And here was the ministry lesson. He's teaching them through this illustration of the, the loaves and fish with 5,000 people. It's what I'm going to call the lesson of cause. C-A-U-S-E. Cause. Let me explain. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. And write this verse down. Listen to what it says. Paul, the Apostle Paul is speaking. He said, I planted ministry seed. Apollos watered that ministry seed. But God was the one causing all the growth. God was the one taking my little ministry, Paul, my little ministry, Apollos, and God was making it change the world. You know what um, the key to all ministry is? Let me say it this way. It's handing the Lord your little bitty loaves of fish uh, and bread, your little bitty pieces of fish, and saying, God, here I am, here's this. You've got to multiply this ministry and influence because this is all I got. You know where the best ministry always begins? It's when you recognize who you are and what God's given you, and you give it back to him, and you say, God, and you'll have to cause it to happen. You'll have to multiply this 10,000-fold because with me doing it, it's ridiculous. It'll go nowhere. I had to learn the lesson of the ministry years ago that I can do about that much in people's lives. But if I'll submit to the Lord my little bitty loaves, my little bitty fishes, and ask him to bless it and multiply it, it might turn into something. Again, keep the context of what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is teaching his men, you, had a, you did a great job, God, so I sent you out, but you're going to change the world on your own about that much. If I'll bless this and multiply this, you'll have something one day. And I'll tell you what the Lord will do in your life is, he'll let you try ministry by yourself and you'll be a rank failure and you'll come back to him and say, Lord, now you've got to multiply this. Ah, nothing. Anybody been there? I've been there a hundred times. There's nothing like ministry to humble you. There ain't nothing like it. There's nothing like doing ministry to people's lives to go, that, those words didn't work. My efforts didn't do a whole lot. Oof. It drives you to your knees, to your face to say, God, you have to multiply this. God, you have to increase this. And the Lord says, you'll give me your loaves and fishes. I just may, may not. But you have no chance unless I do something that I multiply it, the miraculous. So you look back on your ministry, and it's, if God did use you, if God did something, you have to say, God took what little I gave him, and he took it and ran with it, if you will. I love the verse. It's Psalm 127. It talks about the hand of God on your life. It says it this way. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who seek to build it on their own. Wow. Wow. I planted Apollos water, but it was God who was causing the increase. God causes the increase. Lesson number four is in verses 45 through 50. Look what it says. And immediately, Jesus made his disciples get back into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the multitude away. And after bidding them farewell, Jesus departed to the mountain to pray. He was practicing what he'd already preached to them earlier about learning how to come away. He'd had a long day of ministry. Now he's going to go himself and pray. Now verse 47. And when it was evening, the boat was in the midst of the sea. You'll know this story. And he was alone on the land. Verse 48. And seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was very great against them, about the fourth watch of the night, which middle of the night out in the ocean, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. And he intended to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost, and they cried out. They were terrified. Verse 50, For they all saw Jesus and were frightened, but immediately he spoke to them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. What's the context of these verses? Jesus is teaching his disciples how to do ministry when he is gone one day. What's the lesson here? It's what I'm going to call the lesson of courage. The lesson of courage. There's been the lesson of coming away, the lesson of compassion, the lesson of cause. Now there's the lesson of courage. All through the scripture, people who wanted to have a ministry influence on their lives, they're constantly being told, being told by the Lord, Take courage, take courage, take courage. Now, the word courage in the Bible always meant uh, uh, the power to do what you do is right. Do you know that? That's what courage means in the Bible. The word courage in the Bible means to have the power to do what you know is right. It's one thing to know what the right thing is. It's another thing to do it. I have that problem all the time. I know what's right all the time. I just don't have the courage to do it. The Bible meant, in the Bible, courage, it meant do what you know is right. Well, 
but always in Scripture, when the, when the word courage is told from the Lord to one of his people who he wants to have spiritual influence in life, whether it's Joshua, Jehoshaphat, Moses, Abraham, the word courage is always connected to what phrase? I am with you. I am with you. You're not alone. It is I. I am with you. Always in Scripture. Courage and the presence of God are always connected together. You can take courage because I am on this boat right side with you. I'm with you. You're not alone. Again, what's he doing? He's teaching his men. Even when you won't see me physically, I will be with you. Take courage. You do the right thing because I am with you, supporting you, undergirding you, blessing you. You're going to feel alone all the time, but I'm with you. You know, part of the, the, the angst of today, the agitation of today is it's easy in the season our, we're living in these last few months to go, I just feel all alone. Well, you're not alone in that feeling. We all feel that way sometimes. The Lord says, though, you do what's right. I am with you. To your death, I'm with you. In the afterlife, I'm going to be with you. Take courage. Stand up, men. Do the right thing because I am with you. You'll always need to have courage. Your courage comes from the knowledge that I'm with you. You're not alone. And the fifth lesson and we'll be done. The fifth lesson is in verse 51 and 52. This is where this story really ends, this whole section of Scripture. And it says this, verse 51, And Jesus got into the boat with them now. It wasn't just on the water. He got right there in the middle of them. He's with them. He's about to take control of the boat. That's the point. He's outside the boat. He's still with them, but he's letting some things happen. He's going to jump in the boat with them. He's about to take control. And the wind did what? Somebody read it. And the wind stopped. Who's in control of the wind? Who made the wind? Who in other parts of the scripture said, wind stopped blowing, and the wind stopped? You remember in, other, in the scripture we read, oh, back in Mark 4, the men were so astonished because when Jesus just spoke to the wind and the storm, and it stopped, and they went, this man talks to nature, and it stops. So he does it again. This time, though, he gets in the boat, and the, he didn't say anything. The wind just says, he's in the boat, he's in control, we better stop. We better just, the man's here, we better stop. And the wind stopped, and they were greatly astonished. Earlier, he spoke to the wind and it stopped. Now he just got in the boat and the wind stopped. He's not just in control by his words, he's in control by his very presence. He didn't have to say anything, and the wind just knows we better stop. We better stop. And the wind stopped, they were astonished. Verse 52, it, it closes, for they had not gained any insight from the instant of the lows, which the instant of the lows was, he can do anything he wants to. He's he works miracles. He's in control of all this stuff. But their heart was hardened. What was the final lesson he's trying to teach them? They would never really fully learn this lesson until uh, they see him after the resurrection. They touch his hands. They'll never even fully see it till they see him ascend. They'll probably never even fully see it till they see him work by his spirit in their lives the rest of their ministry. But here was the lesson he was trying to teach them. It's very simply this. It's what I'm going to call the lesson of control. Who is in charge of this thing called life? Jesus says, I am. Who's in control of your ministry? I am. Who has all power? I do. So there was a real simple lesson. You've got to come away. You need to have a compassion to the people in your ministry. You need to know that I'm going to cause the increase in your influence, really. You need to, have to take courage, and you better know at the end of the day that I am in control of all of this stuff. Most of those men would lose their disciple by martyrdom. They would be killed. To the very end, they had to say, even this is under his control. It's the lesson of control. You know what will anchor your life and ministry is to know that God is ultimately in control of all this. I think, uh, this is really a statement I wrote down in my notes. You can write it down. You're going to go crazy if you don't think God's in control. I would. I'd go crazy. I, I, I'd go crazy half the time anyway, and I know God's in control. <laughs> yeah. If he didn't, I think I'd jump off the bridge. No, no offense. Um, I'd live, I would get out of bed sometimes. What gets you out of bed sometimes, what keeps you sane sometimes, which certainly allows you to have a life beyond yourself and ministry to other people is going, all that's going on, somehow God's in control of this. He can stop the storm when he wants to. He can tell the storm to start when he wants to. He's in control. He's in the boat. He's in control. You know, uh, um, I'm going to close with this. I guess it was about a month ago, 
I think it was that first presidential debate. I talk about agitated. I was extremely agitated that evening in a way that I don't think I've ever been as an American citizen. Maybe you weren't. I just was. I mean, agitated. I woke up the next, I mean, I didn't sleep well that night just thinking about it all for some reason. It just bothered me so bad. And I woke up the next morning, and I'm just depressed. I'm discouraged in a way that I, I rarely am. And I thought, why am I so depressed? What am I so discouraged about? Why am I, I just feel so defeated. And I thought, that last, the, the debate that I've heard just troubled me so bad. That's just me. It didn't have to be you. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. For me, it just bothered me. And I'm shaving that morning, looking in the mirror, and I am just incredibly, overwhelmingly depressed for our nation, for our lives, for whatever. And I just sense, and I say this very cautiously and carefully, and I don't say this very often. This happens to me a lot, but I don't talk about it. The Lord has kind of spoke to my spirit very clearly in my mind when I'm sitting there just almost crying. And I don't cry, but I almost was crying. I think just for my family too, everything. I just felt like the Lord said to me in my spirit very clearly, as I'm shaving, I got my head down. The Lord said, you're going to have to trust me in this. Now, Jerry, that's not your nature to trust me. But you're going to have to trust me in this. And in all this we're going through, it's the first time I went. You are in control. Now, let me tell you, there's been a lot of emotional highs and days for me, including today. But I've had to remind myself a hundred times in the last 30 days, including about a hundred times a day, you're going to have to trust me in this. Which in me, it meant, I know what God was saying to me. It's so natural for you to trust the government and trust your life and trust all the systems you have. And that's all fine and good. Nothing wrong with all that. It's great. And that still may always be there. But I sense God saying to me, I'm in control and you're going to have to trust me in this. I think that's what he was saying to the disciples. Guys, look, at you're going crazy in this boat. You thought you've seen a, a ghost. I step in. And you're astonished because it calms down. Guys, you better know this. I'm always in control of this. You're going to have to trust me as your life goes on. And there's going to be a whole lot more things happen in these men's lives that are much worse than this. Again, they'll all be martyred for the faith. They'll, all, they'll have their heads cut off. They'll be, they'll have, really, in many ways, they'll have terrible lives. Ministry will cause them a lot of misery. But they change the world. They change the world. But... How many times I wonder did they have to tell themselves? Remember that Jesus taught us to come away, be alone, rest. He taught us he's the cause for all our ministry influence here. He's the one in control. We've got to have compassion for these people. This is his thing. I bet you they had to remind themselves over and over. I, I, I have this picture for the next, many of these men would live another 40, 50 years. Some of them only five or 10 years. I have a feeling many times they said, Remember the lessons. Remember. And that's what I want us to do tonight, too. These are just lessons for us. Great scripture. I know you want to have an influence in your life. You want to have a ministry. You need to remember these things. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight. It's just good for us to be here to have a little bit of peace spoken over us and a little bit of truth and just remind ourselves that you are God. You're in control that you calm the storms, you start the storms, that you have the beginning from the end, and we are, we are bound to trust you. And sometimes you even put us in places that will force us to trust you as the boat and the storms all around us. You just jump in and say, I'm in control. Lord, thank you for this reminder to me, this word. I needed this today, as I studied and tonight. I need to be reminded to come away with you and rest and hear from you. I need to be reminded there's no ministry I'll ever have unless you cause the increase. I need to be reminded that ultimately you're in control of everything. And uh, then we're to love folks around us. Thank you for the truth of your word tonight. Thank you for the privilege of being in this place. Thank We don't take it for granted. Thank you for our health. Uh, thank you for the, our friendship. Thank you for this church we don't take for granted. Thank you for the opportunity to be together. We do pray for all that's going on in our world. And we just trust you with it. What's going on in our lives? Bless our families tonight. Keep them safe where they are in their travels or wherever they are. Uh, uh, I pray, God, you would multiply our lives with your blessings. We need your blessings in our lives. We need you to take what little we have and multiply it. 
Um, and so we trust you in that. Thank you for this time we get in Jesus' name. Amen.